Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tim, we're going to be talking about Docker. Um, we're going to be also be more focusing on sort of like Docker and production and stuff like that. Uh, I had a bit of a fun time, so we, the slides are actually just going to give a quick intro as well. So the slides are just them off the intro, and I'm going to mainly do this through examples and stuff like that. But also with you guys, if you guys get stuck and you have questions, please ask. I found this actually far more beneficial that wherever you get stuck, you don't understand something. Ask me and we talk about that because generally I find that if you've got the problems, everyone else in the room has, doesn't, has the same problems. And, and, and generally you guys enjoy it a lot more than just listening to me talk about the things that I find interesting in Docker and stuff like that. Um, first of all, how many people here are using Docker? Okay, how many of you guys are using things like Swarm or Kubernetes most probably? Kubernetes in uh, Google? Yeah, running yourself, well done, that's hard, hardcore. Uh, every time I, I've tried to sit and do Kubernetes myself, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, I'm mainly going to be showing you guys Swarm here. Everything I'm showing you here works in Kubernetes or whatever you want. Just take the same. For me, if you're a smaller company, Swarm's easier to get up, but all your images and all the ways you connect them work exactly the same in Kubernetes. So, so just, you know, don't take it, oh wait, I've seen how to do it in Swarm, you can't do this. Kubernetes actually has more power. You can do more things than Swarm. Uh, the big thing is with more power becomes more work, more things you have to manage. Uh, that's the big thing. Uh, if you're going to do Kubernetes, if you're going to start, rather go into one of the cloud guys and get them to do it first while you're learning it. Uh, if you want to play at home, Swarm is a much faster way to just get up and running. All right, I'm just going to start with uh, Docker. So you've basically heard Docker's great. Some of you guys are using it. Um, I'm doing an intro quickly because quite often I find quite often if I go directly into what Swarm is doing, some guys get lost with what we're talking about. Um, so for the guys that do know, just please forgive me going over Docker, Docker again, just the basics of Docker. Um, so, so the whole thing with Docker is it it's, doesn't solve the problem that most people think. Most people think it's actually about uh, you know, replacing VMs. Yes, it replaces VMs. It's lighter than VMs, all the rest of it. The big thing that Docker actually had it was the deployment and packaging. It basically gives you Git for your servers. Like basically that is the big thing that Docker solves. It's the whole thing of I can commit my image and then move that image to a server and run it. And it comes with all the libraries and the files and everything and everything it runs. Like if you want to learn anything that Docker actually solves and why people are so excited about it, that's it. It's actually got nothing to do with about lightweight VMs and all the rest of it. I'm pretty sure VM, VMware and them had actually done that with that they try to do it, but a very simple way of deploying and doing a packaging of an image with all your dependencies, they might have also actually taken over from where the Docker guys did. Uh, as an example, the guys, whoever has BSD, you guys had jails for years, but it was never a big thing. Like guys used it, but it never became what Docker was, and the main reason is, is the tooling they added to it. Like jails was there before um, the containerization was there in Linux. Um, and once again, as I said, it's, it's about isolating and wrapping your stuff. So it's the whole thing. At the end of the day, what Docker does is you basically create a virtualized environment. You put all your libraries and stuff in there. And I'm able to now save that. It actually does a tar thing. And I'm able to push to a central repository, think Git, and then I can pull it. And when I pull it onto the server, it comes down with the version of the MySQL libraries that I want. So when I've tested on my local PC, I know that it'll work on the server. Um, and, and if you've ever done massive deployments and stuff, that's quite a big thing to solve. I don't know if anybody here in the old days had to like release patch files to servers that are out in the field. Like I had to do that, and then it goes there, and on this one server, it's only breaks. Now what do you do? You actually have to ship the server back or go out to the server to fix it. Uh, with modern Docker now, generally that breakage is very, very minimal because you've packaged the whole thing, and it's, you know, they, they do checksums on, on what you're pushing down so you can actually guarantee that what's on there is the same. Uh, you can even do now audits and security checks on that as well. Also, if you, if you look at what some of the guys are doing, you can do a double deployment of your software remotely and then roll back. Um, it obviously gives you the versioning. This is, once again, just talking about the guest stuff and the repeatability. Um, the other th nice thing that they ordered was the Docker files. So this would be describing how your images get built. This, this, this is what everyone thinks gives them the versioning and all the rest of it isn't. It's actually the fact that when you build your asset, your end asset, with a Docker file, you save that into a registry. It's actually, everyone's not aware, like the registry is actually the big thing of Docker. That's the big thing that actually gives you all the tooling. It's, the, it's, it's your GitHub, right? 
The Docker file is just that it gives you that versioning so I can commit how my images are built. But if I'm building my images every single time, then you're actually doing it wrong with Docker. You want to build an image, deploy it to a registry. Then when I pull it everywhere else, I get guaranteed. Because you know, has anybody done a, like a, an update of a server? And you do an update of another server two years from now? You have different servers. So the Docker file lets you know what's in your image, but it's not what gives you your versioning and repeatability. It's the fact that you build an image and you push it to a central repository, you tag it the same as Git, and then you can pull it everywhere else. Uh, just to show you, I'm not going to go. I'm going to go over all this stuff very quickly. This is a basic Docker file. You know, you can see if you've ever done any service stuff, it's very similar. Uh, that maintainer thing's actually gone now. They're doing that with tags, but I still have all my files with that. Specify what you're doing. The other thing that it gives you it gives you the ability to build one image off another. I'll show you a Docker file they have for. So the, one of the apps that I'm going to show you is running a PHP app. Um, but basically, I build a base image with all the PHP libraries and everything running in it. And then I just basically pull the git of the actual software that I need to run into another image. And it gives you very, very quick builds. Uh, this is basically building a ability to run Firefox via uh, you can do a remote X server with this one. So you can do that as well with Docker. Um, as I said, it fixes the bottom up easy, simpler scaling. Um, it also allows you to run multiple versions. So this is one of the things. So it, you know, this is a bad example if you want to run two versions of Apache. But if you if you're doing a rollout, and let's say you want to uh, test a new version, you, you can actually run the new version of your software or you can run staging and prod on the same clusters and all the rest of it. So you can run multiple versions of different things. Um, you might not want to do this, like if, if you're running an ISP and you have lots of hosting, you might not want to do that because obviously every time you run Apache there's, there is a memory and you can rather do it with vhost or something. Though what you do get is you get the same some similar isolation to what you do with uh, if, you, if you give all your clients virtual servers without as much overhead. There are ways of getting out of it, obviously, but there's also ways of getting out of uh, virtualization. So if anybody tells you, I think they're both basically getting very secure, and both, both everyone out there is working very hard and securing it. Um, I'll say at this moment in time, I'm not really sure if virtualization or, VM, or you know, containerization, which one's more secure if you're doing it correctly. Uh, you can run Windows on the stuff as now. I've never done this. Uh, I know the guys who are doing it are very excited. You can run clusters of uh, both. Windows and Linux servers. Um, I know uh, some of the, the big Unixes also have Docker now. I, like, I don't play in that world. I play mainly in the Linux world. Um, that's, that's where I'm happier. Uh, OK, downsides, it obviously requires a bit more storage. If you are running multiple versions of things like Apache instead of doing uh, vhost, you will use more RAM. Um, it, it, it solves some of the scaling problems but not all of them. It's like it gives you the tools to solve a scaling problem. It doesn't solve the scaling problem. You still have the big problem of DBs. Like anybody who tells you that DBs are simple and any, they have a magic thing that fixes DBs and, and saving of data in a, in a way that's safe, easy, like can easily do it, that they're lying. Like DBs are a hard problem to, to make them highly available. Like you can go the Mongo route and all the rest of it, but I'm talking more if you want referential integrity and things like that. You know, you still have to do the same things with Docker or any other tooling. If you, you know, you have to run slaves or you have to run, uh, so there's some clustering things for MySQL and Postgres, there's Citus DB. You can go look at those things if you want clustering. But Docker doesn't solve that. It allows you to do it easily. So yes, you can deploy it and you can script how it works. But, you know, if I put a MySQL into Docker, it's not suddenly highly available. Okay, it's, it's a mistake a lot of people make. Quite often they put it, other thing is, if you're starting to play, be very careful of databases. You can make this stuff safe. Uh, I'm going to show you with this thing. So I've got some stuff running in AWS, and we're running on um, EBS storage. So even if a cluster server goes down, we can pull it up on another server. If you forget to mount your data outside of the Docker container, and then you say, clean, your data's gone. Right, OK. So when you start playing in this, don't start with your database. I'm just, I, I have friends who've lost database stuff because of that. You can recover it sometimes. So if you do make a mistake and do that, don't do a clean of your containers. If you go find all the files that are actually saved under var lib docker normally or on your virtualization. So if you do get there and you just stop, you can save it. But just be careful. People have been burnt here quite badly. Um, look, 
The other thing, and this is something a lot of people don't talk about Docker or any of these things, it adds complexity. Right? It is harder than just taking a server, logging in, installing Apache, installing whatever. You know, like nine out of ten, you can get that done if you've got all your scripts ready. Uh, hopefully, you're using Ansible, you can get it done quite quickly. Um, so there is, it is harder, but like any of these things, it is harder. Though if you're running more than two servers or three servers, my belief is that complexity then decreases. Also, once you've learned Docker, like for me, it's now easier using Docker than to set up a server. So when I set up servers now, I set up a very simple server with Docker. All my containers then, I just pull from wherever. I've got all that set up. I have all the things. So it's the whole thing, oh, do this. is going to make your life easier. Unfortunately, like all new technology, when you start playing with it, it's hard initially. Um, sort of why a lot of these things coming out, this is a bit harder one. It's the whole thing is these things are not to reduce cost of servers. That's a big thing. It's about reducing cost of humans. As servers are getting cheaper, like it's becoming, that is the cheaper thing to do. Like, you know what I mean? Like as a human, as a developer, how many servers, if you take your salary, how many servers can your company rent for your monthly salary? Right? And you look at it, it's a lot of servers. So computing power is not the problem. It's, it's, we now at the point where the developers, which is a scarce resource, is the expensive thing. So all this tooling and stuff is coming out now to, to reduce the cost of people. It's, it's why AWS, if you look at AWS, it's more expensive until you take in the factors that you're not paying for the server admins. Right? And as soon as you take those things into consideration, you know, somebody who's managing your database, like, you know, that's a full salary, it suddenly becomes cheap. Same with Docker and all these things. They make it fast and easy to do work on multiple clusters and servers and thousands of servers um, and not to have as, you know, like you as a single person can run your own cluster now. Um, okay, this is not so much anymore. It requires some other things you need. You have to date kernel. Uh, if you're going to be running Docker, try to stay away from CentOS for now. They are getting better. Just every time I've, I've had problems with CentOS. Ubuntu seems, I know everybody hates it. Ubuntu seems to be, be the most stable, but I think Debian's getting there. Um, I think Red Hat is there. I just haven't touched it in a while just because I had some bad experiences with it. Um, but I know they've, they've, they've been working on it quite hard. So I'm pretty sure they are there. So I'm, like, my knowledge of CentOS is about two years old now. Um, but I had lots of fun with things that were supported kernels for Docker. Uh. Sorry? Is Ubuntu. It's what they tested most of their stuff on. Um, so... They are migrating and doing other things. So, so the big thing with the Red Hat and stuff, it's not as tested as much. Um, but Red Hat is working like, I, I, I'm pretty sure what I'm saying now is two years old and it's totally a lie now. I'm pretty sure that Red Hat right now, if you're using a modern version, is up to date. But they, they did things like they did wrote, instead of using the, the storage system that everyone else was using, they did their own one. And then it's buggy because honestly, it's, it's the whole thing. You want to use the one that most people are using? Because then most people are going to hit all the bugs before you do, right? And they're going to fix it. The thing with this is, like, uh, once you're running, like, you actually need a very simple service. So you can also, what's the, there's a, Quora's. You can look at something like that, right? And that's done. Um, my head is, like, I like, I still run some tooling on my base system. And I pick one that I'm comfortable with. Um, if you are comfortable with Red Hat and you're willing to, you need to run a, a, as an up-to-date Red Hat as you can. Then it's okay. But, like, normally when the guys are running Red Hat, they're running, like, two, three years old. And that's not a good, that is not a good fit for, for Docker. Yeah, that's network stack, store, like there's been a couple things. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just asking what's the problem um, that people have had with Red Hat. And it, it's normally, it's, it's, you know, Red Hat is more conservative, so, which is what you want. In a big organization, you want conservativeness. So this is not, like, they're doing the right thing, but it causes problem when you're using bleeding edge stuff. Okay. Right, that, that's your trade-off always. You want to use bleeding edge stuff, which Docker is. It's fairly stable. Well, it's stable to my thing, you can test it. But it is more bleeding edge than most other things out there. It's becoming stable. So as I said, I think what I'm saying, if you're running the latest version of Red Hat, I think I'm talking bullshit. Um, just I've seen guys, and you know, they're running three or five year old CentOS, or I should say CentOS more than Red Hat. Um, I've seen them have lots of weird problems going on. And it's, at nine percent it's been the storage, but uh, like network, like you said. Um, the thing is, you can then still run your Red Hat or CentOS inside Docker at that point. So this is just the thing that's giving you the kernel to run Docker. You want to have nothing else on those servers. So it's once again, is your, your servers are more secure and cut down because 
like what else should you be running on there? So on mine, I've basically got Docker, and then I've also got some just monitoring stuff. So I'm going to show you the net data stuff I have. Um, and that's pretty much all I have on my base system. Uh, everything else then runs inside Docker because, you know, the less you install in your base system, the more secure it is, the less you have to update it, the less problems you have. Um, and then feel free to use, and my advice then is when you start running your Docker containers, use the OS that you are comfortable with. Right? Don't, if, you, if you like Red Hat, use Red Hat. Uh, until you work it out, and then once you've done that for a while, you can start playing with Alpine or all those, which is fun because your images are sunny, like, of significantly small, and they come down a lot more. But you also hit a lot of other weird problems. So like I've hit problems when I've been running Node and Java things sometimes in, because they do their own version of C, the lib, libmule C things, which you can get around, but it's, it's now you're finding problems that aren't Docker. So just start with the one that you're comfortable with. Um, as I said, it doesn't out of the box solve the resiliency replication, right? The, the clustering stuff does solve that, but once again, if you don't know what you're doing and you run one server up there, right, and that server dies and you haven't set it up, it's going to fail. It's like anything. Like, you know, you set up HR of network where you do what, uh, IP migration on a server. Um, if you don't do that, you don't have high availability, even if your, your software supports it. Um, it doesn't solve you from bad code. Nothing out there, like there's how many to go, well, if, if I do this, it's going to solve me from all this bad code. Like, no. Uh, you need to know bad code is bad code. Um, you can bring any server down with bad code. Um, uh, it's a tool to help with specific problems. It's a very powerful tool. Like, I wish I had this tool 20 years ago when I was doing some of the stuff I did because it would have, I, I was deploying sort of HA uh, proxy low balance of things out in remote clients and stuff like that. And it, and it would have just like this solved so many problems for me. Uh, we had versioning and checking, like we had a whole bunch of work. And even then, you'd roll in an update. And just for some reason, that server, like that update would break halfway through. Um, now your server's foobot because, you know, the kernel failed. Um, it, 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 it solves so many problems, which is, I wish I had it. Um, not a magic bullet, but it does solve a lot of things. Um, okay, this is a bit old side. You can look at Vagrant. Uh, I, this is old. I would say uh, Docker for Mac is your best, or Docker for Windows if you're going to play with it. I, I should actually. Also, if you want to play with things, this play with Docker. Who's here been to play with Docker? Okay, everyone here go to play with Docker right now. It is the most awesome resource to learn Docker. Basically, um, it, Docker guys got gotten to some other guys who actually did the work, but Docker's sponsoring the underlying hardware. They've given you effectively Docker that you can run in your browser. So underneath your real servers running there, so you can say, basically, I want a Docker environment. You can do your Docker installs, Docker runs. It will map ports externally. So if you want to test a web server, you can do that. You can do uh, Docker swarm clusters in it. So it will actually spin up three, and you can do all the swarm stuff in that. And then it's up for like 12, I think they give it for you 12 hours, and then you shut it all down, and you can bring it up again. So if you're wanting to learn or whatever, they've also got tutorials that they'll work, walk you through. Um, it's an incredible resource if you're wanting to learn Docker. It, like, seriously, guys, I'm, I'm a, like, it's scary what these guys did to get this to work. They've got Docker in Docker. Um, guys, we're talking. It, it's very, very awesome. Also, if you are playing with Kubernetes and stuff now, uh, the Docker for Mac and Docker for Windows has the ability to run Kubernetes in it that it can install a little Kubernetes cluster for you. So in, if, you go, if you install Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, uh, you can, and you go through the settings, there's a thing where you say enable uh, Kubernetes, and then suddenly you have a Kubernetes cluster that you can start using. Uh, my big problem with this, whenever I enable that, my Swarm stuff starts to stop working. So if you're going to play with Swarm, be aware you can't have them both running at the same time. Um, and then maybe look at, you know, the mini cubes or something like that. Okay, um, demo time. So a lot of this demo is actually going to be talking through, through stuff. Sorry, I was, I was supposed to have more slides, but uh, Docker Cloud broke yesterday. So I was up late till four this morning getting everything moved and, and working. I thought the demos were more important than more slides. All right, okay. So I'm going to start talking about working with Docker in production and how you dev against it. So first of all, you're going to have a need a registry. Okay, so that's the first thing. Whenever you're going to start with Docker in your organization, you want a registry. And I would, even though they did break, um, I don't break often. And when they broke, it, it just broke me uploading new image. It didn't break creating new image. And they've got hub and cloud. Cloud is, gives you a bit more power. They're the same price. If you pay for the one, you get the other. 
and it lets you do building of Docker images, and it gives you a registry. Um, but they used to be a bit expensive, but nowadays they're cheaper. I have run my own, you can run your own registry for Docker, right? So you're going to spin up a server, you're going to manage it. Just the sheer amount of time you're going to spend on that is not worth just using their one. Uh, I think it, I, I've got, okay, I've got 50 servers now, but I've got 22 images I can do. Cost you $22. So it's like for 300 Rand a month, uh, they're hosting all the images. You can build as many you want. It integrates with GitHub. Uh, it will push to Slack for you. Um, like I'm not paid for doing this. Just once this pricing hit it, like I, I've saved more time in my own personal money just moving. I moved everything out of, I was using Jenkins and my own registry and there's something called my Portana Portis that you can do from, from the Suzy guys. So you can run your own registry with the GUI and it's got rights management. So if you are going that, Red Hat also has one. I didn't have time to play with it because I found this and went that way. Uh, but if you want to run your own registry, if you are running your own registry, go look at um, Portis. And basically it gives you a GUI and auth on top of your registry. So now, you, and it also can do LDAP integration if you guys got AD or something like that. So if you're in a big organization, it's maybe what you want to do. Or you guys are going to be running uh, F Artifactory. Also do some of this stuff for you. Um, but basically, you can push in here. Um, so I'm just going in here. So I bought up. So pretty much, I built a whole infrastructure. Just so you know, like last night, between in about six hours, whatever, I built a whole AWS infrastructure, uh, servers, images. So I'm going to go through all that, uh, all the images. So you'll see these talk images, all those things I did pretty much in one day. Um, so you can actually set up a whole deployable infrastructure with Docker and Swarm with high availability um, within a day or so. Uh, you, you can also use so all the stuff I'm doing at AWS just because that's where all the scripts I have. I have done this with uh, Azure as well. I've done it with um, DigitalOcean as well. I have some physical servers at Hetzner I'm doing this with. The stuff just moves. Like That's the big thing. Once you have an image, like you set up your cluster wherever you want, and then you say, okay, well, Cluster run, run servers, and it just pulls it off. You can move. I could move us out of uh, AWS to like uh, Metal on Metal or any of the other cloud providers within a day or two, um, and maybe quicker. The big thing is I, I'll show you. I use Terraform to set up the infrastructure. Is I just need to set up the scripts for the, the different infrastructure. Um, it, it's quite easy once you're getting this. It's like all that lock-in that you might be getting with AWS or the rest of it uh, is gone. If, if, you, if, you, if you move everything in here, like the side effect though is obviously if you want to use the RDS or those things, you are stuck in a bit. Um, and that it might be. So it all depends where you are with, with your stuff. Okay. So I just want to get... I've got too many things going on here. Okay, so, so generally when you start with stuff, you're going to start with a... So I'm not going to go into the Docker. If you guys have any questions afterwards of how I built the images, and you want to actually see my Terraform scripts and Ansible scripts and everything, please come to me. It's just, it's, we don't have enough time to go into it. So, so that's, that's my big worry right now. So, so please, I'm happy to share most... I, I can't give you everything just because I have some keys in here. Uh, but I'm happy to... Like if you give my email, I'll email you everything, all the rest of it. Um, and I'm happy to talk through how I did it and how to set it up yourselves. Um, it's just, as I said, right now, I... I no, that's not what I'm looking for. Presentation mode. Okay, so I'm not going to go into how I'm building the images and stuff. So your first thing is obviously... Okay, so you've built an image, you push it to the Docker Hub. Uh, it's quite cheap, or you've built your own registry. It's very easy to do. If you're, building, if you're running your own registry, it's free. Uh, if you Google registry, uh, the Docker guys have provided a Docker image that does it for you. All right. Now, now I'm going to start pu pulling into my organization. Um, I'm going to first obviously want to run all my local stuff, all my development and everything, and I'm going to move all my development stuff into Docker. Um, I'll show you those in a couple of seconds because it's a bit easier if I show you the overview. But then I'm going to want to run those on my local PC. And for that, I would recommend if you're going to go to Swarm, run Swarm on your local PC as well, or Kubernetes locally, and you're going to write either you're going to write some YAML, a YAML file that describes your infrastructure. 
So here's a YAML file. So, sorry, I've commented something else, but let me actually take all these things out. Um, and just to show you, I can rep I'm replicating in this everything that is going to be running on live. I have Redis running, so there's a Redis server. Um, the other thing that the Swarm and the Kubernetes gives you is they give you, allow you to run things in networks. So you can create virtual networks across your cluster. Um, they also allow you to run so that you can also encrypt it across the cluster. I think Kubernetes can also do that now. They can. Um, so when you see is when I'm connecting to this, I'm actually saying, I want you to connect this to this virtual network on this server. Um, I'm going to start with the Redis one because it's quite a simple one. So first of all, I'm just using version 3.6 of the Docker Compose files. Um, I want a Redis image, so I'm just using the default Redis image. I'm giving it a host name that doesn't end. Um, okay, so once you hit clustering, and s so if you're running a single server, okay, you only have one port 80, right? Once you start working on clusters, you have multiple port, port 80, because you have a port 80 per server. The way that um, Docker Swarm has had it, if I start something mounted on port 80 or bound to port 80, it binds it to every single server in the cluster. So if I have uh, 50 servers, every server on port 80, and I bind a service into port 80, if I hit any of those servers on port 80, it will route through to the service that's bound to it. Okay. That sounds like quite hard if you want to run multiple services, but how you get around this, you just run a load balancer in, in your cluster. So uh, the load balancer I use is something called Trafic. Uh, you can go out there and get it. Um, it's very easy to use. It will also do integration with Let's Encrypt, so it will do your uh, search generation. I, I have a document that I'll show you now where I actually do my search generation with Let's Encrypt. Um, sorry, how are we doing the time? Um, and it can do all that. So here what this is saying is basically, um, sorry, I'm just explaining what this is. I don't want it to be visible on the load balancer. So that just says basically don't make Redis externally available. So only things internal to the cluster can see Redis now that are bound on this network. So I get isolation as well. So only other services or, or things running that are running bound to the Cantor network can see this Redis server. And th when they speak to it, they can speak to it on this DNS name. So it also injects DNS into your thing. So this is the other nice thing that it gives you. You start up Redis or MySQL or whatever, and you give it a DNS name. Then anything else on that network that speaks to that DNS name gets the IP that it needs to speak to. So you just now use your normal environmental config and say, speak to Redis.server, and it does a DNS lookup. So like, like, imagine you have multiple servers. It now starts to work like you're running multiple servers. Um, so that's something there. Uh, DNS. Now the other thing is you can run two different networks. Let's say I've got a staging network, which I have here. I'm going to show you the staging network and a prod network, and they're on the same cluster, right? I bind, I create a Cantor whatever staging network and a normal network, and I bind all the staging servers to the staging network, and I bind all the normal ones to the normal network. Now, but I can now use the same DNS name because remember, it only looks at the, 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 the DNS names that I add that are on that network. So when I bring up, I'll show you the compose files just now, the actual server name for the staging Redis is exactly the same. It's just bound to a different network. So it allows me to get my, close, my testing of my two staging and prod to get closer and closer so that, you know, it's the whole thing is if you cookie cut to everything when something breaks, you fix it the same way everywhere and you pick up the mistakes. As soon as you start diverging, is, is, is where errors creep in because you forget, oh wait, I, on the staging network I've called it Redis staging, but I forget to update my environmental file. Like I've had, had one recently with a client where they're rolling out and I started looking at the staging, I was like, wait you guys, you're rolling out to staging pointing at the prod servers. Um, and this takes that away because now that can't happen because as long as I bind it to the same network, okay, uh, the staging network, I can have the names the same and it can't speak to the wrong thing. Um, here's starting up the traffic image, and basically that just starts up a server. I'm just going to show you that quickly as well. So I'm just trying to find it quickly. Okay, so there's traffic's front end. It, it, it is authed right now. Um, so these are just some of the things that bring up. It brings up the back end. 
um, and it does a routing. And you can see like this thing, net darts at the purple socks. Um, it does a host routing for me. And I, I'll show you the thing where I add that just now. And basically, you bring up the thing, you just give it a environmental variables, and it will route that automatically for you. The other thing it also do is if you have, um, let's say I bring up five API servers, right? Um, it will then load balance those for you as well. And Docker will also do some of that for you. So it's actually built into the Swarm stuff. It actually uses VIP, oh, what's it? I'll, I'll think of the name just now. It's like VIP load balance, which is built into the Linux code. It's very efficient. Um, and it will, so that whole thing of where you hit any external server and it will route it, it will also load balance across if you have multiple servers that you've told it about. There we are. Uh, when I bring it up, I just say, I want you to be listening to port 80, port 43. Um, it is also doing some SSL, which is not needed. I'm running this in AWS. So I'm also using AWS search generation for this. Um, I'm not going to go, I'm just seeing the time. I'm not going to go into all the, uh, I've gone back on the name. Um, I'm running Portana, which gives me a GUI on top of this. Uh, here's Portainer. You guys, if you're running any clusters in Swarm, look at Portainer. It basically gives you a visualization of what's on your clusters. So here I'm running a three-node cluster. But here's my stacks, my services. You can see I'm running mail, logs out. So this is one I spun up last night, so I've got a whole bunch of containers running. Um, you can see these services are also running scaled. Um, I even have my... Here's reporting that I'm running inside Docker with on each server pushing in. Uh, if you guys haven't come across any data, look at it. It's very awesome. Um, I can also then look at different servers. Um, all of this is running inside Docker, by the way. Um, all right, so that's Portainer that I bring up. Um, and that basically just gives me a GUI so I know what's going on. Um, there's the MySQL that I run against. That's how I just run against MySQL. I do a volume mount. Uh, th these are all running also on my local PC, by the way. So what I'm showing with sorry, what I'm showing with the web is local. But if I go to okay, maybe I'm not having started. Let me just restart it. I'll restart it just now. Let me not do it now. We're running short on time. Um, I can run all these things on my things. Um, I build, when you build your images, try and build them to use environmental variables. Um, so, okay, that's setting up MySQL. Just, why is it not? So I'm just going to move you guys to showing you the live stack files because we're going to be running our space soon. Cool. All right. I'm just moving to the, li the live files. So with live files, I've split each of them into their own, basically, service and stack. So if you look here, what I'm showing you in Portainer is, is each of those files that I'm going to show you now. Um, OK, so I'm running Elasticsearch. I'm running a distributed three-node cluster Elasticsearch deployed via Docker, nothing weird. Uh, I'm also running um, something called Rexray, which allows me to mount EBS volumes. So even now, if I have a cluster and a server moves, it will move the EBS volume with you. You can do the same in these things to do it with, uh, once again, all your cloud providers. Um, there's Logspout. Basically, what this does, it grabs all logs that are sent to Docker. It will then send it through to the Elasticsearch. So basically, as long as I have my containers with my API and my, my web servers sending out to send it out, uh, it's all going into Kibana. Um, I have, you can, there's a split up by mail relay. Sorry, I'm just we're out of time. Um, and there's a web GUI. On, on the other node, when I'm running locally, basically I run the same. I just mount when I run. I run actually the same containers I do on live for the APIs. The only difference is I mount the files that I'm editing in as a volume mount. So as I'm editing, it's looking at my local files. But the entire container and its files and everything are working exactly the same. Um, I'm going to have to show you guys a bit more. Any questions? Sorry, I have a lot more here than I expected. Any questions from anybody? Hello? Yeah. 
Hi, thanks. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, have you given any thought to something like Rancher? The reason I ask is because, I mean, it does a lot of the heavy lifting that you are, um, you... Yeah. So don't get uh, me wrong. No, 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 no. I have looked at Rancher. The problem yeah. is every time, like I've been playing with Docker for like five, like from the beginning. And my big problem is I've hit all these things when they were beta. <laughs> and I looked at Rancher then and it just caused me a lot of pain. It made all my life very hard. Like I wanted to do something and I knew how to do it with the command line. And now I need to do it. And now, oh wait, it's not doing it. But now how do I get in to get it to do it as if I'd done it? Um, apparently, they, they, once again, it's like, I haven't looked at it for two years because I've now solved it. So I'm, I'm basically got Ansible for the Docker stuff. I'm using things. My main reason why I'm not always pro something that solves all my problems is because I'm a power user. When it breaks, how do I fix it? Right. So I have Portainer that's giving me a view, but I can delete it tomorrow. And because I'm running everything manually by hand, I have complete control of my, my, my swarm and my stack files and all the rest of it. That answer is a very bad answer if you're beginning. Right? If you're beginning, I'm very pro using tools that give you the power, right? Because you have too much to learn. Um, so as I said, don't don't take people who play a lot with some things answers as the correct answer if you're beginning, because we now power users, so the, the tools get in our way. When you're a beginner, like the tools help you not do stupid things, and, and like it's 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 a weird dichotomy, and, and apparently. Um, Ranch has gotten a lot better. And I would, if I was starting, I'd look at Ranch and all the rest of it. And all my friends who are playing now, who I'm playing to the level I am, really like Ranch, or they've gone into Google, uh, the Kubernetes route. Like, Kubernetes is great and, it's, and it has one. I'm just warning you guys, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more complicated to use. It's not a good starting one. Like, it depends. Like, start with just Docker commands. Do the run commands. Actually, just get a mental picture of how it works before you start going up to these things. Because it's only, like, if you get the basic image of these things, it's very, it's oddly enough that what they're doing is very simple. But if you look at the complicated side of it, you're not going to realize how simple it is. So later when you're on the Kubernetes, you're like, oh wait, this is all it's doing. It's just linking these things. It's run, running a container. You've got a thing that's moving it. So if I shut the server down, it will redeploy to the other servers. Um, and then you start worrying about things like volume moving. So that's what the Rex ray is giving me. It's that if I kill a server and I bring another server up, it will remount that volume into it and I don't lose. So like there, it's busy mounting my Elasticsearch indexes so that I can, I can also bring more in. So let's say my load starts getting up and I had to do that with one client. I can bring three more servers in, like in a couple of seconds. I don't have my thing fully automated. I manually just pull them into the cluster and then you just do a rebalance. But it will then unmount it and remount it onto the next one without, like, I wouldn't say it's quick because the mounting of the things is, is a bit slow. Uh, stay away from the EFS volumes if you can. Every, every time I try to play with those, it's just, it doesn't work. So I've just stuck with EBS. If, okay, this is going very interview for you, not AWS. Talk to me afterwards and I'll explain my problems with EFS. It's just, I had fun. It's what I want because it will scale as I go. I don't have to say, this is your size. So right now, if my EBS volume falls up, I'm going to have to grow it. And, and I don't want to worry about that. Uh, but I could, I could not, I, I spent like three days trying to get EFS to work. I just, I have EFS working where I've mounted it, and it works really well. It's a really cool tool. Uh, if, you, if you don't know, it's an elastic file system inside AWS. And basically, you say, I, I want a storage location, and you don't worry about the size. They only charge you for how much you're using. It's not like a volume that I say, give me a 600 gig. You're just mounting, you can just throw stuff in it. So now you don't have to worry if your uh, elastic thing just keeps on growing, just ignore it. But you're going to pay more, but it means that it's not a oh, damn it, we run out of space in the middle of a, a deadline. What do we do? Uh, it's just not. But though, then again, I've been regrowing stuff on AWS quite a bit and works fairly well. I haven't had too much problem with regrowing stuff. It just works. Any other questions? Yeah? Sorry, just. Yeah. Um, for, for a database, is there any um, performance penalties for using a volume versus a mount? They're the same thing. So, so when, when you say mount, so it's a volume mount. Um, yeah, like when, when I say Docker volume creates yeah. versus tech V whatever. No, 
No, um, so just so you know what's unhammering, when you're doing a volume, great. It's, it's doing the same thing underneath. It's just giving you a named, just, it's, it's putting it somewhere and giving it a name and it's like a storage thing. And the, the major advantage with that is that it's now not just attached to that image. So let's say you want to update your, you want to update the MySQL, right? Now you bring it up and down. Now that volume, if it's just a, like a directory, if you've done a directory, you're safe, and that's normally how I used to do it. Uh, you, the big problem with doing the dash V, uh, if you're doing a directory, is once you hit a cluster, you have problems. Right, because which server did it start on? Okay, you, you don't know. Like, I, 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 I hit the, I've hit this problem. So now you know, and you start using volume plugins to do external storage to your service. So this is what Rexray is doing for me with, with an EBS mount, right? So whichever server that Elastic comes up on, it will mount the, the drive into it. So now it can move. But to do that, you now have to do named volumes, and you have to use the volume plugins to get there. So I, w I would advise if you can start moving to volume plugins, go that way. Cool. All right. Cool, thank you guys. Please, if there are any questions, sorry, uh, there's a lot more here than I went to, and I can also show you I have a lot of Packer and Terraform scripts for you guys. Cool, cheers.